NASA has said there are chances a newly discovered asteroid could collide with Earth in December 2032. That's just seven years from now. Asteroid 2024 YR4 was discovered on the 27th of December last year. This asteroid has a diameter of 55 meters. It's roughly the size of the meteorite which crashed into Tunduska in Russia in 1908. The asteroid initially had a 1% probability of impact. NASA recently increased these figures to 2.3%. Joining me now from Washington, D.C. is Dr. Amitabh Ghosh, planetary geologist who's worked with NASA on the Mars mission. Dr. Ghosh, welcome to the News 9 Plus show. It's a pleasure. Dr. Ghosh, is asteroid 2024 YR4 going to collide with Earth? So, you know, if you look through the backstory, there are multiple observations which happened. And so we are in this process of assessing that uh, what is going to happen. So there has been a ground-based observation. There has been some observations of South Africa. And then in March, there will be observation by the James Webb Telescope. So all this will refine the models. So the probability being put out, I would say, you know, this is a very tentative thing of an event which is going to happen long, long afterwards. And um, there are very, uh, it's a very tough observation for an asteroid. It's a very tiny body. Um, so it, it has to be a specific time of day, et cetera. So I wouldn't be very worried, but I would just watch um, the, um, whatever observation comes out as the trajectory is defined. In the same story, you'll see that there's also a possibility this will, the, this asteroid will hit our moon which is a lower possibility. So it's the bottom line is it's not really frozen yet. It's a it's an assessing mode. Interesting. We still need to study the course and trajectory of this asteroid. So where does this particular asteroid 2024 feature on the Torino scale, which tracks the uh, hazardous nature of space objects and how uh, impactful they could be to Earth? And uh, tell us why Mumbai, Dhaka, and Kolkata are in the danger zone. Yes. So the Torino scale was interesting. It was, you know, it was just being framed while I was graduating my, on my, my PhD. So it measures um, the hazard and the destruction it will cause. So, so here there has been some big news that certain cities are more prone to it. I think that is probably not the context. The context is, if you if it were to hit, hit these population centers, which is Kolkata, Dhaka, Bombay, Lagos, etc., yeah. the damage will be maximum. But the asteroid doesn't know where it is about to hit. The asteroid will hit uh, as a matter of probability. And if 70% or 75% of the Earth is oceans, there's greater likelihood that it will hit the oceans. And then the, you will have... Uh, there you might have a tsunami because the water is displaced, etc. But um, but if it uh, hits the population centers, then there will be massive damage. So so what reminds me is in I think 1908 there was a um, asteroid impact in a Siberian forest and the entire forest burnt down. So imagine if that hit Moscow or London, you know there'll be huge uh, casualties, right? But I think that that probability is even fainter. If you think of the population centers, how many cities there are, probably it is less than 0.5% of the area of, of the Earth, if not even lower. So I don't think if you sum that possibility of 2.9% that it will hit and then 0.5% that will hit a population center, then if you multiply the probability, it's very, very low. So Dr. Ghosh, uh... As I understand it, what you're saying is that the chances of this asteroid hitting the oceans are far greater than it hitting a city because the oceans make up 71% of the water surface, uh, the Earth's surface rather, of the uh, planet. Yes, because the asteroid doesn't know where to hit, right? It will just hit anywhere on Earth. And most of Earth, fortunately or unfortunately, is oceans. So, so that is where it's most likely going to hit. Well, that's a relief, the chance that it could just be a water burst and not as we fear a deep impact uh, that Armageddon meets uh, deep impact, a Hollywood movie from the 1990s. But what would the planetary geologists be looking for 
when, as you mentioned, you know, the James Webb telescopes are going to be swinging towards this particular asteroid uh, a few months from now? Hmm. See, is this, this is very, very simple. Say you are looking at a car. So you, you are looking at the position at multiple times. So maybe one second, two second, three second. And from that, you're trying to um, see the velocity as well as the direction. And because say you, you have a side profile view or a um, straight view, so say if it's going away from you, your um, the the measurement that you make is more of an error bar, has a more of an error bar. If it is like this, but still it will have an error bar. So that is what the telescopes are trying to do, trying to find the vector velocity and direction. And from that, they'll try to um, see whether the orbit of that asteroid um, um, is um, uh, with the orbit of Earth. It clashes with the orbit of Earth. So it's nothing very intense. We do it, we try to estimate all the time. If you have a cricket ball coming at you, your eye is trying to estimate what is the velocity and direction. And then based on that, you move towards the ball to catch the ball, whatever. So we do it uh, in, as a human. Here it's just maybe we will have bigger telescopes looking at it, just trying to get a thing of, of the same problem. Like a cricket ball hurtling at you, uh, a good analogy there works for the subcontinent. But Dr. Ghosh, you know, meteorites have changed life on Earth. The meteorite that hit the Earth 60 million years ago wiped out dinosaurs and uh, saw the rise of mammals. Uh, explain to us how this could actually produce some kind of uh, world-altering uh, event. So that is fascinating, what you just said. So, so I'm like miles away from the Smithsonian Museum. And if you go into their um, um, exhibits, which are like housed in, in the warehouse, um, there's a rock where you see um, you have dinosaurs below that layer and no dinosaurs above that layer. And then you have a um, element which is found in meteorites, which is iridium on the layer when, when, when this hit. So, so it's fascinating. Probably what happened is it hit the earth so hard and then there was um, a lot of dust and that uh, um, hit the sun from earth and that causes a, caused a huge... Uh, um, so, so imagine when we have this solar eclipse, even those few minutes, um, the life on earth, like birds, etc., get a wrong impression. Imagine if it was, um, if the sun was not visible for a few months, then what will happen to the um, whole food cycle, the trees, the animals? So, so it was a very confusing time. And of course, there was dust in the atmosphere. You don't know how much dust. So that caused the entire species to gradually um, die out. But, you know, human life on Earth is limited. The, the um, life of our sun is four billion years. Much, much before that, the sun is going to you know, become very, very hot before it dies. And then the, the earth at some point will vaporize and melt and become plasma. So that is what we are ultimately in this equation. At some point, the earth will not survive. So, so that is far, far away. That's probably a billion years away. But the near future, of course, you know, uh, uh, I think there's something to watch. Uh, but one interesting thing is if, something was to really hit, we don't have a foolproof technology to protect Earth. You know, uh, Dr. Ghosh, despite the thousands of nuclear weapons and rockets and missiles on Earth, it's interesting that we still don't have the technology to destroy something like a meteorite hurtling towards Earth, something that should have been the focus of possibly every nation on Earth, survival of the planet. So this is very, very true what you're saying. So, so why it is unrealistic? Say someone threw a rock at you, right? And then you take a, um, something to disintegrate the rock. So because of the laws of physics, the rock will break up, but still come towards you because the momentum is, has to be conserved, you know, um, by, by the law of uh, conservation of momentum. So, so the rock will still come at you. So if you could have this asteroid and it broke up, you had this nuclear device, um, it will still come at you. And it's also not completely clear if it was a very huge asteroid, how would you break up the interior, 
right? You could have nuclear devices on top, but then would it disintegrate the inside? Nobody knows. And um, so it's not uh, what NASA did. There was a mission called DART. Um, so they crashed a spacecraft into a small asteroid and they could, they could just change the trajectory a tiny bit. And that was sufficient to create a large change in in the trajectory so so something like that could be tested but you know they have done it for just one asteroid you have to be timely you have to track it you have to have that spacecraft ready so there is a significant amount of logistics involved so there is no ready plan um, that i think we have in our back pocket that that can just be unleashed I'm just reminded of uh, what Elon Musk has been saying recently that we need to move to other planets to prevent life from being wiped out by a cataclysmic event and why we need to get to Mars. Do you think that that is actually going to fuel a new set of uh, uh, scientists and uh, technologists who are going to actually argue Musk's case to go to Mars? So I think this is a... Um I think Elon Musk likes this hypothesis of going to Mars. I think where it um, doesn't add up up to now is Mars is very far away. The moon is three days away. Mars is seven months away. Okay, so, so to have the logistics in place to do this mission and think of emergencies and do a human mission, do large-scale movement of humans, and then... Um, um, some of it has been figured out. For example, NASA has figured out to make oxygen on Mars. But there is, you have to have extractable water at a reasonable cost for human use. Otherwise, you cannot keep carrying water and oxygen. Um, and then what are you going to do? Are you going to do this for 7 billion people? Um, so there's a logistics problem. So, um, and, and then who said that the Mars is more hospitable? Um, you have to... Um, it's not hospitable, right? I mean, for this large scale movement. So for the human race, and then what happens when the sun dies? Um, then how do you escape this solar system? So you have to go to some other interstellar space. But to get to the nearest star is um, four light years away. To give you a perspective, Voyager was launched uh, in 76 and in 50 years, it has traveled less than one light day. And so you have to travel four light years. Um, so, so, so imagine how far you have to go to the nearest um, star, and even then, you don't know whether there there is a planet, a habitable planet around that star, which is Alpha Centauri. So, so I don't. Th there is too much of a fairy tale, uh, the settling on Mars scenario and escaping Earth. Fairy tale or uh, science fiction, which could become reality or science fact? Who knows? But for now, we need to keep our fingers crossed, keep studying 2024 YR4 as it hurtles towards Earth. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Ghosh, for that absolutely fascinating discussion.